I went on a road trip recently, off camping to the Wabar Crater. And we were driving along on the road and then suddenly saw on the side, a little way off, an old fort, an old stone fort. And so I thought, oh, let's stop, let's go for a walk, have a break in the trip. And we walked up, it was on a tongue of an old lava flow, and there's the picture of the fort at the top and some of my friends climbing up. And then on the other side of the hill, we saw a little village. This amazing old mud huts village and stone huts and palm frond roofs, some of which were still intact, some of which had fallen in already. It looked like it had been fairly recently abandoned. And it was this sign of very spooky, weird isolation and desolation. Why had this village been abandoned? What had gone wrong? And we looked around just to our right, and there you could see the answer. There was a palm grove, completely dead. The leaves still there in many of the plants. Some of them had their heads had fallen off. And when you looked more closely, you could just see nothing. You thought nothing alive. You looked very, very carefully down on the ground. There you go. There's a few plants left, very, very salt-tolerant plants. These palms had died because of the increasing salinity in the water that had been used for irrigating them. And that had led to the, uh, the failure of the palm grove, had led to the abandonment of the village. This is happening all over the place. This is also on the way to Wabar Crater, a little way away from that previous sign of desolation and devastation. And here we've got a combine harvester. In fact, there were two of them <laughs> sitting in the middle of nothing. <laughs> Gravel, dust, not a sign of any agriculture in sight except those two rusting, dead <laughs> combine harvesters. And you can see here, this is a near, near Jeddah, a field site where we're working in collaboration with King Abdulaziz University. And the irrigation infrastructure is rusting. Look at the tree next to that irrigation tank. It's dead. We see the signs of death, salinization all over Saudi Arabia. This is a global phenomenon. Groundwater is being depleted globally. And this has been very well validated and documented, in particular by a team led by Jay Familietti at NASA. And they have documented very clearly that most of the major aquifers in the world are being depleted. Seawater is intruding in some of the world's most fertile agricultural lands, the river deltas of the Ganges Brahmaputra, the river delta of the Mekong in Vietnam. Very well documented intrusion of seawater, partly through global climate change, partly through the damming of the rivers, partly through the erosion of the soil. So where some rice crops could be grown for three years, three times a year, now sometimes it's only twice a year, sometimes only once a year. And sometimes now it is becoming impossible to grow any rice in those incredibly fertile fields and they're being turned over to brine shrimp farms. So, what we need to realise, I'm going to give you here now some facts, not some alternative truths or alternative facts or any of these other things that seem bizarrely to be falling from the sky on our heads. I'll give you some real facts. And one of the real facts is that about one-third of our food is grown under irrigation. It's the equivalent of the lunch we've just had. Each day that we eat comes from land that has been irrigated. And about two-thirds of all water used on the planet by humans is for irrigating crops. So agriculture, Irrigation is very important for agriculture, food production, and the biggest, by far, the biggest single use of the world's fresh water is for growing that food that we're eating. But, as you saw from the depletion of the aquifers, much of this use of water is not sustainable. Aquifers are depleting, wells are drying, seawater is rising, rivers are retreating. The World Economic Forum has, for the past six years, in their analyses, and these are the real, you know, these are the real smart people here, 
the World Economic Forum for the past six years has listed in the top three of the greatest risks to world economic security, they have listed water crises. This is a major global problem. But everybody tells us we need more food. The FAO says we have to increase cereal production by over 50% by 2050 if we're going to meet the growing population and the growing demands of the population that we have on this planet. We need one billion tons more cereal. That's an increase from two billion tons to three billion tons by 2050. That's not that long away. So we have this massive need to increase world food supply and to do this, assist and to do this sustainably. And we need to do this by increasing productivity per hectare. And we have to do this even faster than we have been doing over the past 50 years. We have to increase food production faster and sustainably, and we have to do this in the face of a global, large and accelerating global environmental change. And we have to do this despite these significant threats to water supplies that we can see with our eyes and that we can document from the NASA satellites. So, we need innovation. We need serious innovation. And that's the core business of universities. So let's get down and do some innovating. Now I say we've got a major water problem on the planet, thus a major challenge to agriculture. But you look around, there's water everywhere. <laughs> For every drop of fresh water we have on the land and in the land, we've got another drop of water that's called brackish water. It's not as salty as seawater, but it's a bit too salty for us to be able to easily use for human consumption or for plant production. That's called brackish water. And for every drop of fresh and brackish water we have available on the land, there's another drop which is frozen. So I guess we could keep burning the oil and the coal, and that might de-melt some <laughs> of that frozen water, but I don't think we should go there. Let's focus instead on this brackish water. And of course, most of the world's water by far is in the sea. And what I'm suggesting as an innovative contribution, I'm not talking about a solution, but an innovative contribution to try to address this global food security crisis that we are facing, is to try to unlock this brackish water, unlock the seawater to try to help feed the world. And we try to do this by growing plants that are salt tolerant and irrigate them with brackish water or seawater that's been at least partially desalinized. So what is the key to this? How can we do this? Obviously we need to have, if we're going to use partially desalinized seawater, we need engineering innovations. In fact, there are many research groups around the world who are trying to do this, and that's great. In this talk today, I'm going to focus on what I tend to work on, the plants. And what I want to do is try to see how we might be able to increase the salinity tolerance of the plants so then we can start irrigating them with water that we can't currently use for irrigation. And the key for this is what I call the new genetics. We can now sequence genomes very, very rapidly. And there's a whole field called genomics we were able to study, both sequence and study, the genomes of organisms. And this genomics is turbocharging genetics. Just as medicine is facing a revolution which is powered by this new genetics, by genomics, so too is agriculture. And this provides us with huge opportunities for innovation, for the serious innovation that we need. Let me explain in a bit more detail. How do we do this? The first thing we need to appreciate is that plants are highly variable. Don't go to the supermarket where you have that monochrome monotony of uniform vegetables and fruits staring up at you. Go to your local fruit shop. We've got a fruit shop in the mosque that has all sorts of different plants there for sale. You go and look at the mangoes in that picture on the left. <laughs> Amazing variety of mangoes. Uh, beautiful. Go to a market, the other photograph taken a market in South America. Varieties of potatoes are stunning. So, 
plants are variable, and this is important. These are naturally occurring variations that can give us the raw material for our new revolution in crop production. The other thing we need to appreciate is that plants are tough. Plants can be really tough. There's a photograph taken out on the mountain biking trips on the left-hand side. A plant in the middle of a hot, dry, dusty plain, and it's sitting there flowering. Beautiful, amazing. And there's another picture taken from southern Saudi Arabia in the uh, mountains, the rocky mountains there, and there's plants, that desert rose, sitting in a crack in the rocks. Astonishing. So plants can be really tough. However, these are extreme examples of extreme adaptations to extreme environments. Is that really relevant to crop production? Don't know, maybe, maybe not. We can see plants that are even growing in the sea. But that's an extreme plant, sitting there, probably a very limited utility for humans. What about crop plants? Well, some of the relatives, some of the close relatives of crops can also be remarkably tough. And this is where we can start to get pretty interested and start doing some serious research. Here are photographs taken in the Galapagos Islands of a very close relative of the tomatoes we eat, which are growing in rocks, being splashed by the sea. How do those plants do it? What genes are in those plants which are missing from our domesticated tomatoes? Can we learn how those plants do it? And then, using the processes of sexual reproduction, cross, integress in those toughness genes into our domesticated tomatoes. We can return also to the cradle of civilization in this region, where some of our major world crops originated, such as wheat and barley. And there were collaborators in Germany who collected about 25 different accessions of wild barley. So not barley that you can grow and get a, get a crop from, but the very close relatives growing on the roadsides, around in the Fertile Crescent, and in fact managed to collect 25 samples which really spans the breadth of the variety, the diversity of these wild barleys. In fact, many thousands of samples were collected, and from those, 25 were selected. And then they were crossed into domesticated barley. And they crossed them, and then they back-crossed them. So we ended up, they ended up generating an amazing resource, which was about 1,400 lines of barley, each of which were three-quarters domesticated, so then they would behave themselves when you grow them in a field and produce some crops, but they were one quarter wild. And so the idea was to see if, by chance, <laughs> from those one quarter wildness that were in each of those plants, we would be able to discover genes that made the plants tough. And so we could do a genetics experiment in the field. This is a picture of a PhD student from our laboratory here at Cal, Stephanie Sada, and that's the field grown in Dubai, collaborators there at the International Centre for Biosafe and Agriculture. It's 1,400 different lines, about half a million plants there, being grown under low salinity and high salinity, and we were able to measure all sorts of traits in those plants, and then we found one line, one gene, from a plant that was collected in northwest Iraq, which, in the conditions in the Middle East, gave a 20% increase in yield, and when you were irrigating those plants in those same conditions, but with saline water, and this was one-third seawater uh, being irrigated with, we got a 30% increase in yield. So there was this one gene in, from one plant that was giving you both increased adapt adaptation of the plants to the Middle East, but then also, specifically, increase in salinity tolerance. Incredibly exciting. Um, result, and these lines are now being crossed into more commercial barleys, both to validate this and to start to deliver that discovery into commercial breeding programs. This is an older example from work done in Australia before I came here to Calst, where um, a, a collaborator in um, CSIRO walked into my laboratory. Um, I was actually in Cambridge at the time with three bags of seed bag of seed with plants that were salt sensitive. This is normal pasta wheat. And then two bags of seed where the plants were unusually salt tolerant. What genes were in the salt tolerant lines which were missing from the salt sensitive line, which is photographed in the middle of that picture. 
I thought I had a lifetime's research ahead of me to answer that question. And one PhD student discovered the gene in just one PhD, one three-year project. And then over about the following three years, that gene was integrated into commercial lines, we were able to do the field trials, we could characterize the gene, could work out exactly the mechanism of a conferral of salinity tolerance from that single gene. And here's some results from one of the publications that came from this work showing the yield or the benefits of that gene uh, from, uh, in, in field trials on yield in a big field where the field is coloured in different colours depending on the salinity. And when you grow the plants in the blue part of the field, the low salt parts of the field, there was no yield penalty, so that, that having that gene didn't come with a cost. But when you grew it in the red and yellow parts of the field where there was high salinity, there was a 25% yield increase. Fabulous result. Remarkable. All from a single gene whose mechanism we could understand. Where did that gene come from? It came from an old cross between a wild relative of wheat and a pasta wheat that was done by a breeder many, many years previously. It was a nice bit of serendipity. So we can try to increase the salinity tolerance of crops that are existing. And another approach we can take is to increase the usability, the benefits for humans, of plants which are already very salt tolerant. Remember that photograph of the plant growing in the sea? A very close relative of that plant is quinoa. And quinoa is very salt tolerant. And it's a plant which can grow in the Altiplano in Bolivia, right next to the world's biggest salt lake. That's the picture on the left-hand side. And it's also got huge variability. There's a photograph of some plants in our field trials in Dubai on the right-hand side. So we've got the raw material of variation, we've got a plant which is really, really tough. Very, very salt tolerant. It's a very pretty plant as well, which is a nice benefit of this work. But it's a far from perfect plant. It's tall, it's branchy, it's leggy, it falls over. You have a puff of wind, it falls over. How useless is that? It also is not really easily able to be planted and harvested in a mechanised way. There are some varieties which can, but a lot of our quinoa that we grow, that we eat, bought in the supermarket, has come from the labours of children who should be at school. So this plant needs to be what we call domesticated. We need to be able to mechanise it. We need to be able to understand the plant and improve the plant. We need to use this to develop a new mechanised crop that we grow in broad acres and irrigate it with saline water to try to help us develop a whole new agricultural system. That's the aspiration. Using brackish groundwater or partially desalinised seawater, we have to manage the soil, we have to manage the drainage water and the aquifer water and develop a new agricultural system. So, by using sand and sea and the revolution in genetics, we can develop a new agriculture and contribute to global food security. Thank you very much.